thank you so much, uh, Rui, for uh, joining us today and give us a talk regarding uh, what you do in uh, NLP and uh, roughly biomedical data and pharmacovigilance in part particular. Uh, we have already shared your one of the last paper regarding what you have done uh, on drug repurposing uh, in, in the context of the COVID. So we are really very happy to have you. Just to let you know, uh, we are a public health research center. So that means you have uh, people uh, with background in biostatistics, in epidemiology, and some are in health informatics, of course. And we have some colleagues from the uh, informatic department also as well uh, with us. Uh, so yes, we're gonna let you about 40 minutes for talk and then we're gonna maybe, uh, you know, you're gonna uh, um, ask, answer some question regarding the Q&A that we have or give, uh, you know, um, directly, you know, um, uh, right to ask you question when you're gonna finish. Okay, so the floor is yours, thanks. We yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, Dr. Piano's invitation for this web, uh, webinar. Um, I feel really honored to share my uh, research experience. So today I'm going to show you some uh, application of natural energy processing on biomedical big data for pharmacovigilance. So currently I'm associate professor and McKnight Presidential Fellow at the University of Minnesota in College of Pharmacy and also Institute for Health Informatics. So I want to give you an overview about the healthcare big data. So as you can see, this is a really nice view that published like six years, seven years ago in JAMA about what is a big picture about that healthcare data. So as you can see in general, there's several um, different types of data like medication demographics and diagnosis based on the uh, clinical aspects. But on the columns, the big columns, the structure versus unstructured data. So structured data usually meaning that you can present the data in well-structured format, such as spreadsheet or some uh, really formatted, for example, the drug, you can have the code and some other dosage dates as well. However, the unstructured data usually provide a lot of information. For example, this can be a, you know, narratives in electronic health records could be the diaries and blogs and tweets, Facebook and some others. But those are really important since they can provide uh, and complement structured data to give you a really comprehensive understanding of the, about the healthcare. So someone estimate the structure versus unstructured. This is in electronic health records, like structured data usually means, you know, demographics, lab result, medication diagnosis, what all structured data refers to uh, notes, patient providing information, like um, they can you know, send through the app or they can send through the patient portal. And then sometimes they share their family history, social history. And there's a lot of uh, diagnosis or findings in uh, radiology reports or pathology reports. All those information actually is hidden in electronic health records and it covers 80% of the all information. So as you may know, natural language processing is a subfield of AI, artificial intelligence, and uh, computer science. And uh, if you can see here, NLP in cover has some overlap with machine learning and deep learning as well. So today I will give you some um, applications of NLP on one of my uh, funded projects through National uh, Center for Complementary and Inti in Integrated Health for uh, Dietary Supplement Research. So um, since we only have 40 minutes, I, I will go over quickly for each individual study and then I will provide a link to each individual study so you can still take a look at that later. So, I will talk how do we uh, initially to get some knowledge information from online resources. And then I will talk about how can we expand terminology and detect safety signal from electronic health records, specifically clinical notes. And how do we mining uh, biomedical literature to discover drug supplements interaction and um, 
COVID drug, COVID-19 drug repurposing as well? And how do we leverage active learning skills to reduce annotation cost? Social media will also to detect uh, supplement safety signal on tweets. And we also developed some question answering systems. Uh, finally, uh, I will demonstrate NLP to parse clinical trial eligibility criteria for uh, quicker uh, finding the patients. So I'll give you a little bit of a background about dietary supplements. Dietary supplements are commonly used all over the world. We refer to herbs, vitamin, minerals, probiotics, amino acids, and others. Use of supplements in increasing. Um, based on one survey, is about 87% of US adults use at least one of the supplements. Um, so sales increase, uh, and also many people use supplements simultaneously with drug. However, the doctors are fully informed about the supplements. So based on the survey, 75% of over 1,000 clinicians over the world they have limited information about supplements, but they are not always safe. Based on the CDC and FDA report, there are 23,000 emergency visits just due to the use of supplements. And also a lot of people use drug and supplement together. So they, um, sometimes they can increase the risk of drug supplements injection. For example, uh, the high performing component in St. John's world can induce docetaxel metabolism through P5450. So docetaxel is one of the cancer drugs. So if you take with the syndrome's word, that can reduce the efficacy of the drug. However, the um, regulation in the US based on the DASHA, this different regulation, um, and then the safety testing and FDA approval, approval is not required before marketing. So, we, and also the post-marketing report only required for a serious adverse event like hospitalization and significant disability or death. So this is why uh, safety uh, info, research on supplements is very limited. Since it's not required for clinical trial, not found uh, safety concern until they are on the market and adverse event reporting is still on estimate since that is a voluntary and only for uh, serious outcome. And the pharmacy study only focus on specific supplement. They cannot really study a lot of supplement. You only focus on one, two in, in the lab. And the drug supplement interaction documentation is very limited since the lax rigor uh, rules. However, the online resources can provide a lot of information about their safety and also their information. Uh, EHR provides patient data for supplement use, and they have detailed supplement usage information. And biomedical literature contains a lot of uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic knowledge can help us to discover undefined pathway for DSI. Social media usually contains the consumer's first um, use experience, so we could discover some as well. But there's a lot of challenges, for example, there's no standardization and then the knowledge of representation is inconsistent. How can we get information across different resources? And there's a lot of um, lexical variance in clinical records, such as uh, misspellings, uh, brand names, product name versus you know, common names. So it's really messy in the clinical notes. How can we get that information consistently and uh, extract it? as well as detailed usage information. So people may only mention, um, discuss the use, but they don't really actually use the supplement. How can we differentiate that situation? And also they may mention the supplement with the, some sign symptom, but how can we differentiate the adverse event caused by supplement or they are taking the supplements for a certain reduce some symptom, which is a purpose or indication use. So all those are NLP questions. So we did the first study, which is uh, integrate dietary supplement knowledge base. This is considered the first um, standardized and integrated dietary supplement knowledge base we call IDISC. So we have uh, IDISC development, uh, three different phases. So first we established the scope, and then we developed a model, this iteration process, 
with a lot of domain experts. And then we create the knowledge base by uh, collecting pre-processing and cross-referencing and also um, mapping them to the standardized terminology. So this is a, a data model we used for uh, a general uh, supplements. So as you can see in the, in the center, this is a supplement ingredients. They can link to a lot of products. So this is many to many uh, information. And supplement ingredient itself can have a lot of um, relevant information like background safety, as well as a lot of scientific names, syn synonym and preferred name. Most important that we also collect the uh, interaction with drug and also we collect interaction rating and severity and their uh, effectiveness, which is a uh, purpose for, and, uh, and, and also their adverse reaction as well. All those terms are mapped to either humanize or measure the, the standard type terminology. So this is the one example like alpha phi. You have different names to represent alpha phi. If you can see the uh, strain is totally different, without this knowledge base, you, it's really hard to get a different lexical variance. And here's a, you know, drugs and high cholesterol uh, effect for or the dominant discomfort, which is adverse event. So this is the statistic of the knowledge base with credit. So totally we get concept uh, which is across four um, high res high quality resource. This is called natural medicine monographs. This is a, one of the cancer center. Um, they provide uh, information about dietary supplement. This is the dietary supplement labeling data. So they have the labels for each individual on market products. And this is the, from Canadian Department of Health. So we integrate them all together and we cross reference and we mapped uh, merged uh, based on their names and um, relationship. So this is the, we craft the ingredients like 4,200. And then we also have a lot of relationships. M many of them is, has ingredient, which is a relationship of ingredient and products. And for a lot of ingredients, we also have the attributes as a set uh, in interaction severity. And we uh, checked a subset of entire uh, knowledge base. I've, we found it's a really high accuracy when we uh, retrieve the data from each individual data source. So what we can use for IDIS is, um, as you may know, UMass, which the unified medical language system considers the most comprehensive uh, platform to collect uh, over 200 biomedical terminologies or vocabularies. And they have some representation of dietary supplements. And we want to see uh, the ideas which we uh, integrate together, specific for dietary supplements, what's the coverage overlap with each other. We found about um, half of the uh, ideas we can find in the humanus. Um, however, the other half, we can definitely provide a lot of sin uh, synonyms. We also have some refined. So this deal is only focused on the semantic types related to dye sub supplements. Um, you see this difference that the humulus whole and humulus distilled, there's not big difference. And the humulus DS is using the parent children relationship only for dietary supplements and vitamin as the parent concept. And we'll find all the concept. We found only 20% of them uh, covered in the ideas. And we, we evaluate using the iDisc uh, versus the Umulus three different uh, versions. And also we compared it with the union of the iDisc with the dis <coughs> distilled. We found um, iDisc, using iDisc on one of the name entity recognition on biomedical abstract. So we manually annotated uh, almost 4,000 dietary supplements on over uh, 300 abstracts. We found iDisc terminology can provide the highest precision. While if you want to get higher recall, you can do use a union of Umulus, Distil, and iDisc. So we use two different um, evaluations, so the strict and linear. So linear, as long as you have the overlap of your identified entity versus gold standard, we consider as true. So you will see the linear evaluation is higher than 
the strict evaluation, the strict evaluation you have the boundary of the turn has to be exactly the same. So this demonstrate the idea space really can help for to identify precise um, dietary supplements why humanize can help to increase the overall recall. But if you really want to get detailed and accurate entity, I just can help. The second study uh, we did is um, how can we expand the knowledge of supplements on Kinkonos? Uh, as I mentioned, like we have a lot of variants, like semantic variants, brand names, and misspelling in clinical records. And we want to apply what embedding models to expand those terminologies. So we only do the demonstration for this um, commonly used uh, two, three, 14. Yeah. So uh, as you know, the word embeddings, especially what to back is a statistical model to learn uh, the embeddings from coppers. Uh, and then the similar words in the similar context, they usually have the similar representation. So what we did is we, we trained uh, the word to vac model in the entire clinical coppers we collected from the University of Minnesota, M Health. And then we used that model to uh, send the base query, which is um, the, the single term of those supplements, the 14 words. And then we see uh, the word to vac model will return a list of similar terms based on their uh, vector representation, and we have uh, some human annotate to annotate the top 40 terms and identify those um, misspelling or brand names or similar terms. And we call that term as a word embedding expanded term. So we use that term to query number of nodes and patients with dimensions. And we compare, only use the base term, which is a single term, as well as we use the ideas, there's two uh, resources we use ideas to expand. But as you know, those resources usually they don't really consider the misspelling. They, they consider a lot of like uh, scientific name or Latin name or other synonyms. So we also use that query. So we did comparison of three um, results. So these are some model training details. So we, we use the different um, size of copper to train the different model. And we, we, we select the most um, accurate model. And we also try the glove at that time. So here the some result for expansion, the word embedding uh, expansion, we found some misspelling. For example, black cohort, uh, people use K instead of C. And if you see here, um, people use A instead of O, but you can see some uh, examples here. Uh, turmeric, there's a missing R here. And for the follow-up exit, we can also use that method to find some uh, brand name. And this is a, uh, the flip switch uh, A and E here. Uh, there's a misband here, okay. So let's take a look at the comparison, the word embedding expanded base uh, versus the base term, baseline chorus. Um, so this is the baseline chorus. So only use the term listed here, you find this. And this is the word embedding chorus. So this is the comparison, like the number of clinical nodes increase, majority of them increase. The most uh, uh, increased one is the flex seat. Uh, one of the reason I think the flex seat, there's a space between also can be found flag, space, seed. And also turmeric, as I mentioned, there's a misbelling. A lot of people use that misbelling. So if you don't use word embedding, expand it, you cannot find that actually a lot of. And compare with patients, you find, well, there's a 79% and 60% increase without even including a misbelling. So this is the comparison, what embedding expanded versus external resource expanded. You see majority of them uh, is positive increase while some of them is negative, even this uh, number is minimum since external resources can provide really comprehensive synonyms and brand names. So I think uh, we could leverage both actually in the future. So this is a comparison of percentage increase in patients. 
So this tell us uh, this is the one like what embedding based model can is a good uh, core expansion, especially when you enter a corpus that is not really commonly used, uh, especially for EHR. That's different system can have different you know uh, sub language. Um, this is a like feasible way that you can find the potential um, you know lexical variance. So the next study, we're trying to um, differentiate the relationship between the adverse event, say patient get headaches with black hole cohort. This is the adverse event of the black cohort. However, this is a black cohort for night sweets and hot flashes. This is the indication of purpose. While in the um, NER, you may, you may identify black cohort and headaches. However, how can you identify the relationship between those uh, adverse event versus indication? So uh, we're trying to evaluate different deep learning models, specifically pre-trained uh, bird models for this task. Um, so this is a comparison for the name entity recognition model. So first we need to identify the dietary supplements and symptoms like headaches, black uh, headaches. And this overall, we use uh, the different LS, uh, TM, CRF models and also uh, BERT based model and BERT model pre training in clinical copper. Uh, surprisingly, we see the BERT model without any training in the clinical copper can prefer the best performance uh, overall. The one of the reasons for clinical BERT is BERT model pre training on mimic, mimic is ICU data. So, However, our coppers is really cover a lot of, not only the ICU, but also the um, outpatient as well. So the copper may be a little different. So uh, there's uh, some others uh, like um, BioBert, Robot, uh, PubMed Bird as well. I mean, this study was done three years ago. At that time, we don't have a lot of choices. Um, so that's a further investigation is worth so for relationship extraction, uh, we found the BioSTM reached the, the best performance um, over close to 90% F measure. So here are some examples. This is a positive relationship, which is indication. If you see like vitamin C and, and for wood, uh, fish oil for hyperlipidemia, and we also uh, cross-check with one of the knowledge base. We found majority of them are there, demonstrate our algorithm uh, uh, feasible to do, but still we found something like fish oil anxiety. Those are actual patient notes, but I removed the protected patient information here. So here are some negative relationship. As you can see, a lot of uh, current knowledge base doesn't really cover a lot of adverse events information. So if you see there's a lot of uh, cross means um, those are not really documented in the current knowledge base. So this the clinical records can help to us to identify some additional, um, you know, pairs. Um, you know, those sometimes sometimes is a rash or flushing. Patients may not really report to the adverse reporting system. So without that, it's not easy to understand the adverse event. However, the EHR can help us to identify those. So mining uh, literature, um, uh, the first study I want to talk about is uh, LBD literature-based discovery for drug supplements interactions. Uh, this is a report by the Wall Street Journal. Um, so the idea for LBD is uh, we have PubMed and then uh, we can use NLP or text mining for identify the relationship between two concepts. So for example, you have a long list, but I, I split in two since if you have the shared concept in the middle, like for example, Y1 and Y1, you could link them to X, Y1, Y1, Z1, and then you could have potential relation X1 and Z1. So one of the example for here is Indonesia can inhibit um, CYP, and then you could uh, extract this um, structured, uh, we call semantic predication, so this is the subject, object, and predicate. In another article, you do the same thing. You could find CYP450 injected with tomiferin. This is one of the cancer drugs. 
they share the same um, gene here. So you can link to say, okay, there are potential interaction between echinacea and tomerophin. So we use this in, in, in illustration to do uh, for entire PubMed. We found some interesting um, pairs like echinacea can interact with um, three uh, cancer drugs and some are known and some are unknown, those are novel. Um, for docetaxel, you could find a grape, grape seed extract or cover preparation here. So a different pathway, but majority of us are through the CYP gene pathway. So here are the, some uh, select predications corresponding to their predications. So if you see echinacea, that this inhibits uh, even this is a predicate here, but in the original text could be a, a verb, a noun, and uh, even a different word inactivated by. So this is all done by one of the NLP algorithm developed by National Library of Medicine called uh, SAMREP. So most recently, as uh, uh, Dr. Dylan mentioned, like we used the uh, um, LBD to identify some potential drugs to treat uh, COVID-19. So the idea is we use a PubMed and also a specific collection of court 19 publication. And we run the NLP algorithm I mentioned called SAMRAP. And then the SAMRAP DB is a collection of semantic predications for entire medicine. It doesn't have to be specific for COVID. While this is a COVID-19 specific relationships. And we did a, a series of pre-processing and we rank based on the information and we do some filtering and uh, accuracy classification. So as you see, semantic predications are not always true since this is NLP. NLP is now not always perfect. So we develop a PubMed bird based accuracy model to identify only the um, possibly true application. And we, we develop a, a knowledge graph and through several types of knowledge graph completion methods, we generate the link prediction. So what we are trying to do is have entity is a drug uh, through the predicate treats, and this is a COVID. So pretty simple uh, pathway. So we're trying to predict the drugs. And we also do the evaluation. So one thing we do the time slicing, which we only use the information before the COVID uh, appeared, which is in March uh, 2020. So we use all the literature before March 2020 and predict what drugs can be uh, treated. And then later on, we use clinical trials that um, identify some potential drugs afterwards, use that to identify that. And we also using some literature published after March 2020 to validate that. I, we also compare with other um, drug repurposing paper to see what are the overlap with, between each other. So this is a, a visualization of the um, um, Tisney, the two dimensional uh, visualization. So different region with color coded, there's a different semantic types. For example, um, the AAPP is amino acid, peptide or protein, uh, DSYN, that is a uh, disease or syndrome. So as you can see, uh, the, the COVID-19 here, this is another COVID, suspected COVID-19, and all those are relationship or um, connection between each other. You can see some um, drugs, uh, which is already identified some relationship in this graph. So this is a, we um, narrow down to only use the the discovery pattern. So this is called closed uh, discovery pattern. Like once you identify some drug, can you identify uh, their pathway? So we use the drug A inhibits in interact with concept B and concept D uh, affects associated with the cost uh, uh, predisposed to COVID-19. And then this is a like a smaller view and more clear view about the proposed drugs with uh, COVID-19. And here are some evaluation method. We use the five different uh, link prediction uh, method. And then this is the evaluation uh, method. Uh, why we found the stealth is one of the most comprehensive or complicated method. However, the performance is 
less accurate than the, the simple uh, trans-E model. And this is the 33 candidate drugs we identified by trans-E and also we manually go over and make sure they are possible. So here's a comparison of the drug compared with our model. Uh, you know, the five models different between uh, five models as well as compared with published uh, repurposing drugs. We found some common drug, but not a lot comparison. Um, so different models, they have different uh, data source, data cleaning, processing. So it is understandable that we found different thing. So as you know that uh, NLP requires a lot of um, human annotations, but how can we save time for this really labor intensive? So we uh, invest the act active learning um, strategy for uh, reduced uh, human annotation or uh, most effectively use the human annotations. So the study is still um, SEMADB, the semantic predications, we use different strategy, uh, active learning process. So the idea is you have a small starting um, point of label data, and then you train the theta and the machine learning model to identify in the unlabeled data what one is um, it's hard to decide. And then you could give the uh, annotator to re-annotate and go back to so the L will increase a little bit, and then you will retrain this again. And then we evaluate uh, three query strategies, uncertainty, representative, and combined sampling. So a starting point is 10% of entire um, population. The, so there's some details I don't go over. And then this is some uh, data we collect, 6,000 um, um, data covered, uh, different predicate. The interbreed agreement is pretty good. Um, and then here's a comparison of the different algorithm. Uh, as you can see, the baseline is the poorest. However, the, the combined one with um, beta equals one perform the best. Uh, we also designed a dynamic beta, which you don't really predefine a beta value. However, you're based on the size, the ratio of the size of unlabeled versus labeled. And the, the performance pretty close to the, the premium one. So this is a, a three method for uncertainty and then representative sampling and combined. Uh, you can see the increase of performance. And this is a, a, our design dynamic beta very close to the best performance. To understand why the uncertainty achieved the worst performing, why representative sampling achieved the best, we use this visualization. So as you can see the, uh, from the curve, the darker means the starting point, the, uh, the sample, the data, while the yellow one is the last sampled. So from this worst performing, you see they started from in the middle and always took around in the center cursor, but they have never go to some outliers here until the last sampling. However, the best performing, they are kind of spread. Sometimes they go to outlier in the in the early stage, so this this is the why they can improve their curve at the early stage. So we also investigate the uh, using Twitter to detect adverse event. As I mentioned, the adverse event reporting Twitter is the most um, uh, one patient get some experience they first report on tweets. And then later they come, they go to the uh, healthcare system to report that. And then they may also report to um, the FDA, but Twitter could be the first um, experience. So we did some data collection. We use some uh, predefined terms using the snow uh, boiling method to identify a lot of synonyms. And then we did some pre-processing trace data and this is the we did some comparison using um, the different um, contextual embedding and lexical uh, word embedding models. We also found the bird model actually achieved better than viable model, which is pre training by, uh, by medical literature, actually. So, this is the relationship extraction similar to the predictive test, but this is applied to the tweets data. We still find the bird model get the best performance regarding the app measure.
for indication and adverse event. We found a lot of pairs actually. Um, for example, this is a vitamin C kidney stone. Um, we compare with the IDESC and the knowledge base, we did find they exist. Uh, here are some, some examples and vitamin C diarrhea tweets as well. Those are adverse events. And then this one we don't find in the current knowledge base, but we found in the tweets more than one time. Uh, Nicin to flush and fish oil to prostate cancer. This is the really uh, my first time when I, when I extract this. Um, but um, those are just the data extraction. And also, this is based on patient uh, experience, doesn't mean um, it's true since we still need a further clinical validation, but this is just information extraction, signal detection process. Uh, the next study, we developed an uh, interactive graph-based visualization for answering uh, dietary supplements questions. Since uh, dietary supplements usage usually is uh, self-guided, we don't really ask a physician about that. So, so we, we focus on seven questions since we did some topic modeling for identify the uh, questions. Um, those are commonly asked the seven questions. Uh, the back end is IDESC. We, we created this user interface and then um, use Neo4j as back end to visualize the term. So for example, what does the uh, product X, the supplement interact with? So this is a sleep app can interact with uh, five drugs here. And if you see, oh, one of the drugs actually I'm taking, you click that. You find what are the additional, um, the supplements that you can replace the melatonin, which is interact with your current medication. So you found medication can treat um, insomnia, and then you found what other replacement can have the uh, effectiveness for that, and then eventually can find. Um, the second study to follow up that is we found uh, the healthcare literacy. So many people actually, they don't really understand the medical jargon. So we divide, but can we use the um, simplified version uh, and plus some graph visualization for consumer to understand that? And we use the um, MTurk to uh, contact some studies. So we have original text, and then we manually created some simplified version. And this is the automatic way uh, to do um, shorten the sentence and also replace the medical jargon with some simple, simplified terms. And then we give them the same question. So each group, we are only access to one of the option. This is the fourth option for only the graph-based representation to understand the context. And actually we found the graph model can really achieve good. The manually uh, simplified fashion is, uh, is best as expected. Uh, however, the, the time-wise, the uh, manually is the, the, the best. And, and however, the graph is uh, comparable to the manually uh, representation. However, the synthetic and CHV, the consumer health vocabulary replacement, costs a lot of time. One of the reasons is the longer sentence lead to many short sentences. It takes time to understand. The last study I want to uh, explain is uh, the clinical trial eligibility criteria. So the patient recruitment delays um, and costs a lot of money. Can we use NLP to parse the trial inclusion and exclusion eligibility criteria? And further, we could use this computable um, eligibility to go to the year trial to find potential patients that can uh, take positivity in clinical trials. But this is the first study to demonstrate that NLP can accurately parse the eligibility criteria. And we are uh, using the, the entity that defined in one of the uh, common data model, uh, Odyssey, um, so demographic observation that. So this is a, a one example of eligibility criteria. And then this name entity recognition for each individual like demographic observation and measurement. And then this is a consider to uh, patient cohort and the EHR, how can we convert those eligibility criteria to a query 
um, language and search eligible cohort. So we did an annotation for you know different entity and attributes and like highlighted in this uh, figure. And this is a comparison of the uh, different NLP system. So there's a Syntax probably is the most famous one um, that commonly used. Metamap is mainly for biomedical literature. Clam is one of commercial products. Biomedicals is developed by uh, University of Minnesota. And then different systems, they have different representation of humanized semantic groups. So semantic groups, this is a you know, chemicals of drugs. In the biomedicals, they have the T, which is a group for each individual semantic type. However, in the clam, they only use a drug. Simple enough. However, uh, in the meta map, we use uh, the short representation in the UMS, which is corresponding to T here. So we did some cross checking and make sure we do the fair comparison. And then the gold standard, we use drug, and we also annotate some dietary supplements, but we group them in the chemical and drugs. So those are uh, annotations and gold standard. And here the comparison. We, evaluate individual NLP system, but we're also using an uh, ensemble model to uh, combine different models to see is that getting better. So in different NLP system trained on the different coppers, um, they have uh, pros and cons if they apply to the different kind of coppers. So this is why we want, we're trying to leverage the uh, uh, advantages to identify entities in different systems. So as you can see, uh, majority of them like biomedical is uh, really good, not really the best performance, even though those performances is not good since biomedics mainly train the EHR data. However, we have clinical eligibility, clinical trials data. CTX is also trained in clinical, uh, the three of them training in the EHR data, the, the final one is training in um, literature one. And then we use some ensemble Boolean combination. Uh, we found performance achieve, uh, improve a little bit. Uh, further, we use the some um, dependent based, um, based model. So we use a CLAM platform. At that time, the Roboter and Electro were the, the two sort of uh, algorithm. So we use them, found uh, this achieve a much better performance. Uh, however, uh, I think the supplement still only like 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So there's a strict and linear. Linear is kind of loose evaluation. So I think the supplement still need to increase a little bit. Um, there still need to be efforts. I think that's it for uh, all my presentations about like 43 minutes so far. So I would like to thank all the funding support and my collaborators. And here's my uh, information, contact info, and my research lab uh, website if you're interested in any of them. Thank you. Mm -hmm.